I would like to introduce Mr. David Gergord and Mr. Eric Orlinski, co-founders of Trouble Network. Welcome, guys. If you have trouble hearing, just raise your hand, and I'll make sure that we shout. Okay? Um, so I had one. Uh, I had eight pages. He had one page, but he brought notes. <laughs> but David, that's what attorneys do, right? They don't shoot from the hip the way we do. Jots anything down a normal kill. attorney. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I I do want to kind of lay the groundwork, and that is Eric is a partner and chair of. Their corporate um, securities, transactions, M&A, private equity, and early stage investment group, where he focuses on manufacturing, um, biotech, and general technology companies in the early to mid growth stages. Am I close to being Perfect. accurate? Great. Okay. Um, David is comes to the table with a world of corporate experience. Um, and I'll let you, you know, take 45 seconds to kind of walk through your background. Um, but the, your latest venture is Treble. Prior to that, you were COO of an organization called Social Solutions. And the other thing that I found very interesting is that you also co-founded an organization called StemulatingMinds.com, which is a nonprofit to help K through 12 students learn more about STEM careers. So, um, I think I covered my background perfectly. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Then I'm going to leave it at that. If any, if any of you want to know anything more about these guys, ask them afterwards. Okay. Um, By the way, this is one of the few presentations where if you're staring down at your phone the whole time, it's it's not only acceptable, it's encouraged, as long as you're looking at our app. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this evening is divided into two parts. Number one is our fireside chat with them to understand in real time. I mean, it's not as if these guys have had all this wonderful success in the past and they're resting on their laurels. These are... These are entrepreneurs that are struggling with the same stuff that all of us as entrepreneurs and innovators and technologists are going through real time, day to day. They're struggling with the same decisions, worries, fears, failures, pivots, uncertainties that all of us do. So it, it's really special to be able to sit here and have them share in real time, not in past history. That's number one, but number two, as I said, we are going to be, they are going to be rolling out the Treble platform to us as a chapter this evening. So tonight's going to be the fireside chat, then, you, then we'll roll into the how-tos of the Treble platform, okay? All right. So <clears throat> the way I look at it, you guys are kind of the odd couple in a number of different ways. <laughs> okay. You've got a corporate attorney. Thank you. Felix. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'll let you two call you call yourselves whatever you want. David's the CEO. He gets to make the decisions. Can I get that right? Both of you have it in writing. Both of you are in your fifties. I'm not going to mince words. You come out of a very successful corporate career. Law is one of the most staid conservative, quote unquote, industries that I know of. And yet, you, the two of you, and an accountant walked into an Ellicott City coffee shop a while back, and trouble was born. But 
trouble was not born in reality. Trouble was born long before that in the mind of you, Eric, if I'm not mistaken. What walk us through how you, what was the problem that you were facing? What was the, you know, call it whatever you want, but sure. you, you saw, you weren't getting something out of something. Yes. And you felt like there may be a solution. So, so about six years ago, the, the law firm I work for asked me to look into how we could use social media better to develop business for the firm. And we had some fairly high paid consultants in who told me what I pretty much already knew, which was that LinkedIn was probably the most appropriate place for us as you know, higher end corporate lawyers to be involved in social media. Um, so based on that advice, I got about 100 of our lawyers trained on LinkedIn. I got them filling out their profiles. I got them connecting with people and building out their entire networks. And then I sort of took a step back and started scratching my head and said, okay, that's all nice, and I see how LinkedIn has its uses, and if you're looking for a job candidate, maybe it has value. If you've lost track of somebody, you can find them again. But it's kind of like a glorified online resume database, and there's not much more to it than that. And I couldn't really find any of the other features, any value that would actually help us develop business. So I took a step back and I started thinking to myself, well, how is it that I actually generate business for the firm? And I thought about the fact that I have a network of business contacts that I'm always trying to grow, but I'm, I'm primarily trying to um, help those people in my existing network to manage the relationships that I have, um, to do things for those people that help them in their business careers, in their life, whether it's you know introducing them to other people who might be helpful to them in their job, whether it's referring business to them in whatever their uh, line of work is and we don't always get those opportunities but when we do the opportunity to refer work to somebody and, and to help them um, is incredibly valuable it's it's what people are looking for from networking so to be able to help them in that way is critically important you know taking people to lunch taking them to dinner taking them to ball games taking them to play golf I do a lot of my business development on the golf course spending four hours with somebody and building that relationship is critical over the long term to that relationship and how they think of you. And at the end of the day, you don't always know how those opportunities are going to bounce back to you, but you know that when they hear of somebody that's looking for the services that you can provide, they're going to think of you. You're going to be high on their list to refer that opportunity to because you've given back into that network, because you give to that community. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could track those introductions and referrals and figure out better where those referrals are coming from, where those, who are the most important people in my network, and I should be spending more time with them than perhaps some of the other people I'm spending time with. So we set out with the idea in mind to, first of all, make a tool that made it much easier to make those introductions and referrals in real time. And by doing that, hopefully the people would use the app to make them. So we've done that, and uh, then it would track in the background where those introductions and referrals were coming from and provide you with um, data and actionable business intelligence on uh, how to spend the time networking. So we, we have kind of taken to calling it, I, I'm sure you've all have heard of, of customer relationship management software or client relationship management software. This is network relationship management software. It's kind of an something that, that doesn't really exist out there. And we have many, many ideas on how to take this to the next level as well. So that's how it came about. Um, our, our third co-founder, Steve Ellis, who's now with us, Steve and I, Steve actually uh, and I put in the original money uh, to start the thing up. Um, and we were down a path of uh, trying to build out wireframes and working with uh, company MindRub to name the thing and, and uh, build an online presence and uh, begin to build the application itself when David entered the picture. There are a couple of things that I, 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 I heard subtly within what you just said about the whole concept of networking. 
One is what I think a lot of us unconsciously may do or think, and that is, what's in it for me? Me, 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 me. The other one is networking in the spirit of altruism. That is giving, helping somebody before you help yourself. It sounds to me as if treble is built on the latter, not the former. Am I? Well, it is. It is. And I don't know, um, for those of you who may have read, there's a book by Adam Grant, who's a uh, professor at Wharton School of Business, called Give and Take. And his, uh, his concept, his theory in the book is that the business world is essentially broken into three groups. Uh, about 10% of the business world is takers, about 10% is givers, and the other 80% is scorekeepers. One of the reasons course we have the scorekeeping function is that 80% of the world is scorekeepers um, people want to know like you know if I give to you I want to I want to keep score and give back but but the the primary thesis of this book is that the most successful business people are the givers the people who give and give and give into their network without expecting anything back are the ones who are the most successful in the long run so we're what we're building, the application and the mindset that we're trying to create among our users is that giving mindset um, in, in order to make the business world a better place, but in order for people to realize that that's how you have the most success in the business world. So it's, it very much has an altruistic mindset to it. So this is, so the, the, the whole concept has been brewing then for two, Two, three years, four years? Probably more than that, four or five years. Okay. Uh, but really only got started with great energy at the beginning of 2016 when David came on as our CEO. That's okay. really when things took off. So you came to a point where you said, I, either I'm going to, you know what, or get off the pot. And that is, you know, take it to the next level. Um, what was that? aha moment, what was that decision point, what was going through your mind about taking, you know, being a corporate lawyer, being in that world, and then saying, oh my God, I'm about ready to take an entrepreneurship leap. Tell us what was, you know, going on in your mind there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple points in time, I think, where you cross that threshold. Um, at the beginning, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this may interest you. I mean, I've been involved in entrepreneurship my whole career, at least for the last 15 or 20 years of it. I've been around people who were doing creative and interesting things, building companies. And it's always been something that's, that's interested me and that's fascinated me, which is one of the things that's led me to this. And this isn't the first business I've tried to start. So I actually have a patent that uh, filed that I that I got granted uh, by the PTO on something totally different. It has to do with something in the in the uh, you know video gaming space. So I've I've tried to go down this path before. And I think you know you have to succeed and fail and and try again. And with this opportunity, this is a lot closer, obviously, to what I do in my day job as well. Uh, and so the firm was very supportive of me doing this because there at the end of the day There's potentially a benefit to the firm if this is successful as well, but um, But that you know, so the first step was getting a patent getting an advisory board together raising that first money and getting people engaged um, We had some temporary CEO people involved early on but, but there wasn't really the momentum behind it until we connected with David and he got behind it. Um, and so bringing David on board and giving him a considerable portion of the equity, that was a, you know, that was a, a big leap moment. Um, raising the first significant capital, I mean, I'll never forget the morning after we, we cashed uh, several significant checks calling Steve Ellis, our other partner, and saying, Oh my God! Like, what have we done? Now I act, we actually have to build something. We have to do something. Like, this isn't just this isn't just something for fun that we're playing around with. We have a commitment to people, and it it's, makes you nervous. I mean, it's it's a big deal to take money, other people's money, um, and and know that people who trust you are expecting you to 
to return something on their investment. And uh, that was probably that was probably one of the biggest steps, the biggest, uh, most nervous moments. Um, and then probably the launch day, that was probably the next after that, which was last November 30th. Uh, one final question, and then I'm going to bring you into it, and we're going to flip the flip the. But point. David's not just a pretty face. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, don't all the time. I won't walk down that path. Okay? <laughs> it's probably the longest I haven't spoken. <laughs> Certainly I know. I, two of us sitting I, I know. Other. Okay, so, so Eric, how, how long before you, uh, how long did you know David before this conversation actually began to take place in the uh, and the concept gelled of you guys working together? Well, so that's an, it's an interesting question because I've probably known David five or six years, but the first time we met, we were introduced by one of my partners who said, you know, David's involved in the technology space, I think you guys should meet and, you know, get to know each other. We had breakfast out here in Columbia at Expectations, and David was running for school board at the time uh, in, here in Howard County, and uh, after what happened with the school board here in Howard County, I think he's probably thrilled he didn't get elected. <laughs> That's another story. Um, but um, nothing really came of that meeting. Um, several years went by, never saw him again, never ran into him, never traded emails. And then um, one of my partners uh, came to me one day and said, you know, I have this client, Social Solutions, they're being sold. I need you to step in and run the sale process. For legal, legal side, I need you to do the legal work. Great. Went to the first management team meeting where they were starting to meet with potential buyers. And there's David sitting across the other side of the table. I'm like, oh my God, I know you. We had <laughs> coffee like four years ago. And um, so we reconnected through that process. The company eventually got sold. A year later, uh, David left the company and he was looking for his next thing he, he wanted to do. And he had, had exited the company very successfully. So he was, had plenty of runway and opportunity to look around for new things. And he called me up one day and said, hey, let's get coffee, and we did. And I told him about my idea. And he was like, that sounds interesting. And I invited him, because I knew his background and, and thought highly of the work he'd done at Social Solutions. I invited him to join our advisory board at first. So he joined our advisory board, attended a couple meetings, gave us some help. And at the time, we were looking for someone to really take over as the CEO uh, after about nine months of him being on the advisory board. And he stepped up again and said, you know, this is something I'd really be interested in. He had, uh, he had a, you mentioned as, as part of his background of the STEM work he had done, but one of the more significant things to Treble that he had done is founding RPI's uh, alumni networking organization. And because of that, he was very passionate about uh, networking for career development purposes, as he likes to say it you know, teaching introverted math geeks what networking is about. <laughs> that's what everyone from RPI is. Um, so, um, and he'll, he'll even admit to that. Um, and so we come at this from a little bit of a different perspective, me more from the business development side of networking and David from the career development side of networking. But he was passionate about that side of it and he saw the opportunity for career development networking in, in the idea that I had, and so he stepped up to, to take on the CEO role. And that's really where our relationship became obviously much closer. Uh, we didn't really know each other all that well until that point. Yeah, I'm going to embellish a little bit. So um, I had retired from Social Solutions, and I had never wanted to do a startup. You know, I had done a little bit of my own many years ago. It was a terrible failure. It's like no interest in doing that again, um, and I was comfortable. I didn't have to go back to work. Reached out to Eric. Uh, we had lunch at um, P.F. Chang's, and he told me about this idea, and it just resonated, right? I love this concept because, as Eric articulated, helping other people is a core part of who he is. And back in 2000, I was unemployed, and introverted math geek, what do I do? How do I find a job? The phone's not ringing. You know, previously in my life, you know, I was always getting solicited for job opportunities, and suddenly after the tech bubble, no phone calls. So I had to learn how to network. So I studied it, mastered it, met with tons and tons of people. I know every Starbucks between Tyson's Corner and Tyson's. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more caffeine, no more caffeine. But um, 
you know, when Eric shared his vision for what he wanted to do on the business side, it's like, wow, and he does it on the personal side as well. But for me, it's like, you know, back in 2000, I started this Rensselaer alumni group with the same exact idea. And the secret that we both share is that networking is about helping others, mm -hmm. right? If you go out, you help other people, good things happen. You generate goodwill, they think of you, and then suddenly, for me, the phone started ringing. And it was this giant game of concentration. I've met, I set a goal of three to five new people every single day. And I started meeting tons of people, and sure enough, on a Tuesday afternoon, I'd meet somebody, and by Thursday morning, I'd meet somebody else and say, oh, you know, giant game of concentration, you, you have this in common with her, and she has this in common with him, and start making those connections, and then lo and behold, the phone started ringing for me. So when Eric shared his vision of what he wanted to do, I said, I'm really interested. I got on, he invited me to join the advisory board, and within a few weeks, a few months, I think it was, um, you get to that decision point, do I want to be a spectator or do I want to drive the bus? And for me, you know, driving the bus is do I believe in the vision and do I like the people I'm working with? And I knew Eric just this much, but just based upon my experience with Eric, I said, he's the kind of guy that I want to get a business with. And ironically enough, if you ask any software exec, who are the first two people you're going to hire? You never hear accountant and lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I've got a great accountant and a great lawyer who's part of our board and helped drive all the decisions. Eric, you're working, you got a full-time day job, and David, you're full-time into treble, at least as far as I know. As far as Eric knows. <laughs> as far as Eric knows, okay, we won't, we won't talk about the other half of your life. He's chairman. I know, I know, he's, he's full-time into it. <sighs> okay. I see what he accomplishes. It's really so, nice. you've got a co-founder and someone that, as I understand it, you look to, to bounce the, you know, all kinds of ideas and questions and issues and decisions that have to be made. How do the two of you interact in that regard when it comes to making those significant decisions, whether it's platform, whether it's financing, what, whether it's operations, what, how do you two communicate and how involved is Steve? in that level of communication and how have you structured your board of advisors so that they're not just figureheads, I'm assuming, but they're actual participating people that are helping the company grow. I'll take I'll take part. In that. Okay. I'll take part, right? um, I treat Eric like a peer and I try to treat everybody that works for the company as a peer. Right? Everybody has great ideas, everybody has a vested interest. Um, we often have 7 a.m. phone calls with our development company out in India uh, because of the time zone differences. Eric's on almost every single one of those. Uh, he's got great ideas, so I don't treat him as silent partner. He jumps in. He's actively involved. Uh, this was his baby. Now I feel like it's both our babies. Um, and I respect where he's coming from. And many times we argue and disagree on things. Um, but nevertheless, we have great respect for each other and we'll hear each other out. At the end of the day, CEO has to take a final, you know, you don't manage by committee, right? So ultimately I have to take a final decision. But I respect the hell out of where Eric comes from and Steve and, and everybody else on the team, the team sitting out there and a couple of them back here, right? Um, so it's really very collaborative um, at this point. I mean, I, what I would say is I, I continue to be the largest stockholder, but when David agreed to take on the CEO role, I told him from the beginning, I said, look, if you're gonna take this on, I'm not quitting my day job. I'm not running this thing. At the end of the day, I'm, I may give you my opinion. Um, I may give you some ideas. I may contribute, and I, I want to do that, and I love doing that. But at the end of the day, the decision's got to be yours, and I'm going to let you make. I mean, I'm I'm going to rely on you to make those decisions. You're going to have to make the calls, and we've stuck to that since the beginning. And and the, the final decisions are always David's. It's always been that way. I told him that from the beginning. What I'm hearing between the two of you is something that I would say you guys are almost one in a hundred thousand, maybe one in a million. And that is you have purposely structured the organization with governance and decision making in mind right up front. As opposed to that's the advantage of having a lawyer from, from a <laughs> as opposed to you know, many 
you know, if, if left, it, you know, if David is left to his own devices, then that means that he'd be doing everything that we entrepreneurs typically do, and that is running helper skeleton all over the place. It sounds like you two have been able to develop that balance and, and establish the govern, governance up front that is a guiding factor in everything that you do going forward. In other words, yes, you may have to make some off the, you know, cuff, off the hip decisions in the moment, but you've got a structure around you. Am I yeah, close? Um, Eric wrote a one-page bio but a 14-page employment agreement. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I would say the relationship that we have and the culture that we have in the company has nothing to do with the legal structures at all. It's a matter of choosing the right people. There was a professor at Carnegie Mellon who said, who quoted a, a Steve Jobs, I'm doing a paraphrase of a quote, right? That the first 10 people that you bring onto a company establishes culture, right? So we've got a great core group. Some of them are out there, a couple of them are in the room right now. And having a team that you can count on, that you can bounce ideas off, that people are not afraid to say, you know, even to the CEO, right? The CEO of a tiny company right now, right? It's really small. But people are not afraid to say, hey, David, I think that was wrong, or I have a better idea. And they'll say it in that way, and I encourage that. And so if Eric has a strong opinion, he'll express it. And we'll argue about it, we'll bring in other people, we'll bounce it around. It's more of a management style than it is a corporate structure and the folks that we choose to be part of that small team. The developers in India are frequently entertained by our arguments on this. <laughs> and it's, it's literally, it would be something like, you know, all right, do you want it to be left or right? I don't know, Eric, what do you think? Uh, you know, left good, no, maybe right, no, I was thinking more right, no, it should be left, you know, do you have a strong opinion on this or a medium opinion on this? You know, so we're arguing like this on the phone, and they just want to know which side, right? So. <laughs> what have been some of your biggest challenges from the time that you two decided, okay, let's take this forward to today? What have you been, what have you been challenged with? Uh, I'll start first thing. So I have been in the, you know, practicing secure corporate and securities law for 25 years. I have helped companies from the legal side raise capital, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, hundreds and hundreds of companies. And it always seems so easy to me. They show up, they have the investor, you know, I write the documents, the deal closes, they get the money, piece of cake. When we set out to raise this money, I thought, you know, maybe 60 days, 90 days, we'll have all the money we need first stage, and then, you know, maybe down the road we'll need to raise money for Series A. Raising capital was the hardest thing I have probably ever done in my career. Um, it just, you have, to, you have to talk to so many people, you have to, um, you know, you have to talk to so many more people and take so, uh, so much rejection from people. People, people basically call your baby ugly. They tell you there's, they tell you there's no way this will work. They tell you that there's no way you can compete in the market against you know LinkedIn and Salesforce and you're crazy. You know they'll they'll they tell they'll, industry. They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll come up with any reason why not, why this can't work. Um, finding those people who believe in you, um, who believe in your ability to execute, who believe in the product and the vision, it's just, it takes a lot of work to find those people and it, it took us far more time and was far more difficult than I ever imagined. And some of those people are actually in this room who believe in us and, and we very much appreciate their confidence in us. It's, it's very meaningful to us um, for them to have that kind of faith in us. And I'll, I'll echo what Eric said and then take a slightly different direction. Raising cap is, is really super hard, right? Because you're talking to friends and family members and acquaintances and all these kind of things. And you really, again, there was a professor who shared with me some comment, which was that raising money is not selling, it's sharing your vision. And whoever shares that vision throws the money in, they believe in you, the idea, the market, whatever. Right? I'd say from my perspective, after that, it's really, um, making the hard decisions. You're saying no all the time, right? We don't have a shortage of great ideas. We've got a roadmap that's a mile long of features and functions. 
We've got some great ideas for marketing campaigns. We've got amazing, talented people that are, are, are working with us. And ultimately, I've got a budget like this. And so I have to say no more often than I want to. And you have to make really hard decisions. You know, what's the absolute minimum thing that we need to do to take it to the next level? How do we get there? How do we bootstrap from A to B to C and head down the path? So, you know, in a corporate environment, you know, if we wanted to have trinkets and spend $500 on giveaways and stuff like that, piece of cake. I've been involved in multi-billion dollar companies and we'd have shirts printed up and all that. When we had shirts printed up, I had to say, how many people, what size are you? What size are you? <laughs> you know, I got one of each because the money was that tight, right? Um, so saying no and figuring out where to say yes to very few instances, and they're all great ideas, just this is the greater idea that you say yes to. Okay. Launched in November. And to date, you've, I know you've got several organizations on the platform, including RPI, the Rensselaer Polytechnic and, you know, Institute. Institute. Sure. Sorry. Um, obviously, we're there. Which, by the way, everybody, before you leave tonight, make sure you go on and join the Startup Grind group so that we can all connect. Um, and I believe that there are several others. And I also know that right now you are, you are operating from what I call a, a traditional SaaS model. You've got a freemium. You've then got a second level. And then you have an ultra or deluxe. <clears throat> Is that going to be enough for you to be able to successfully monetize this business? Yeah, you know, um, we've got individual and um, individual premium and individual ultra memberships. And then we're also going after organizations like Startup Prime, and we're thrilled to be partnering with Startup Prime. We have several other organizations as well. And we'll monetize through organizations, we'll monetize through okay. individuals, and we have some amazing ideas on the roadmap if we can raise enough money and we can get to that point to bring on additional capabilities. But I'll make this really clear, right, because I, I posted about this last week. Some of you have probably heard about the whole Facebook privacy. I was watching Zuckerberg uh, testify in front of Congress. We, Treble, do not monetize your data. Your data is your data. We respect it. You know, Eric wouldn't sell out any of his clients, any of his partners, any of his resources. We don't sell your data. We don't make money <coughs> off your data at all. That's why we charge, you know, for the service. Um, and that's a major differentiator for us. So it will be harder for us to, to monetize, but at this point, we're hoping that there's a wave of people that say, I'm tired of LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, and all these social media sites <coughs> making money off my personal information, right? We're hoping people start waking up to that and saying, hey, for a couple of dollars, if I can be on a platform that has amazing features and functions and helps me and respects my privacy, I'm all for that. So we have a lot of that. We also expect to build an enterprise version down the road so that corporations will actually pay much more, we think, okay. to, uh, to, to, uh, for us to be able to monetize that uh, business. Uh, so now, we're in a world where there are 1.3, 1.4 billion websites out there, 3.8 billion users worldwide, Google 66 billion searches a day, seven and a half million apps in the world. How do you break through all the clutter? How do you get recognized? How do you answer the question, so what's in it for me? Why should I care? What's different about you that I can't get on LinkedIn, Facebook, say, you know, some of the places that we've talked about. Can you give me your unique, defensible, competitive value propositions so that people get it immediately? Sure, I hope so. Um, we find that most people get it when they see the app, right? I can describe it and I'll give you a sentence or so in a second. But once you play with the app for a couple of minutes, and usually it takes a little bit of a learning curve, we're sitting there and showing you how to use it and all that, then suddenly light bulb goes off. So I encourage you, we've got some tutorials, we've got the whole team here, myself, Eric, et cetera, happy to show you and give you a demo and explain it, and then in a few moments you'll go, oh my god, right? But the short phrase is, and so we're working on that, we're working on a better way to explain it, 
without having to demo, right? But the short idea is we're built based on the philosophy of altruism. It's about helping other people. Networking is helping other people and mutual benefit through you know, the relationships that you have. And so what we try to say is that Treble really empowers people to manage, grow, but most importantly, leverage their business network, their trusted business network, for mutual benefit. And that's totally different. You don't find that elsewhere. We have some great features and functions. We've got a wish engine, and we encourage everybody to post, we'll talk about this at the end, mm -hmm. you know, post wishes on the app, and then you can decide. Or on the wall. Or on the wall. On the wall. Um, um, you decide who gets to see those wishes. It doesn't go up to the entire universe, unless, unless you want it. Right? Um, <laughs> but you can decide, only my golfing buddies, or only my former coworkers, or only this group, or that group. You can decide at a very granular level who should see this wish, who do I want to be able to help me in this. We've got an AI engine, because most people aren't good at networking. So it guides you on a daily basis and makes suggestions that unlike, I'm um, still in the air, so I'll, I'll leave Eric to say that one, right? Uh, you can do that one. Go for it. What? You Which one? Oh, uh, the Gardner? Uh, yeah, un unlike LinkedIn, which basically suggests to David that he meet my gardener because I'm connected to my gardener on LinkedIn and David's connected to me, so David should connect to my gardener. This actually, our AI engine actually comes up with, re, uh, understands the rationale why two people should be connected. So for example, let's assume I'm a corporate, let's assume hypothetically, I'm a corporate lawyer in Baltimore. <laughs> and let's assume that Chris over here refers, uh, makes referrals to three other corporate lawyers in Baltimore. And I don't know Chris, but I'm connected to Chris four different ways. The system will, uh, through four different other people, the system will suggest to me, maybe Chris is somebody I should get to know because Chris sent referrals to three other corporate lawyers. And then it will tell me, of the four people that we have in common, who the best person is to introduce me to Chris because that's the person Chris owes the most to. So if you think about leveraging the information that's in the system to provide you with referrals that actually can create value to you in your networking. That's the kind of algorithm that we built into our AI engine. Real quickly about defensible position. If I understand you correctly, you do have a patent on pieces of, tell me, without divulging secret sauce, yeah. what, what, do you, what defensible intellectual property do you have and what are you missing? What, do, what else do you need? Right, so we have, we have filed for a patent. Um, we probably will file for a continuation for that patent fairly soon uh, based on uh, improvements that we've made. But at the end of the day, it will be a business method patent. Business method patents, if we, if we get it, um, business me method patents are not terribly valuable as they once were. Um, they, um, so we, we don't put a tremendous amount of value in it, but it is something that can be used to, we, you know, to caution people against trying to replicate what we've done. So there's some value in that. Um, in fact, there's some theory that some of the stuff that LinkedIn just changed and put on their app potentially could violate our patent if it gets issued. Um, we, have, we have obviously a trademark and a look, and we filed for that, and we've received that so we have uh, protection on the name um, and the look and feel and copyright of the uh, of the site and the way it works um, all of, all of those things you know have some value to them but really the, the key value is going to be getting this product to market and getting it to take off and if it does that you know it will have value yeah. and then <clears throat> I work for the big software companies um, you know the big multi-billion dollar software companies and product roadmaps for mission app years. <clears throat> big companies have installed bases, big companies have a lot of momentum behind them, and they're less likely to try something that might only get a few thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 users because it's not gonna move the needle for them, right? They need something that's gonna drive millions of dollars, otherwise it's just not worth it. So they'll wait for a small guy to come in, prove out the market, and then they'll decide buy or build, right? And so we think we have a great opportunity right now, especially if you look at the core philosophies behind the big sites, they're all about selling your data 
and I think people are starting to wake up that maybe selling data isn't really where they want to be. They want to have their own information. They want to have their own uh, environment. They don't want to get bombarded with ads, with noise, you know, hey, solve this math problem and you're a genius, and look at me, I just won this great award. I mean, that's what you get on a lot of these social media sites. Nothing like that on travel. This is about you helping somebody else meet that other person that's exactly the person that they want. And for example, if you get an email from the big social media sites, hey, you should connect with so-and-so. We get that all the time, right? Our research shows that roughly one-third of your connections on LinkedIn are people that you've never met and you have no real interactions with, right? Whereas in Treble, we encourage people that it's quality, not quantity. And if you get an email, if I get an email from Eric saying, hey, David, you should meet you know, Sally. I know Eric, I trust Eric, I'm gonna meet Sally because he said so. Right? Whereas the other sites, you get these, hey, you should meet you know, so-and-so. It's like, I don't need another Ukrainian best friend. Right? <laughs> so it's a very, different, a very different philosophy, and I think that would preclude the big guys from coming in, because it's hard for the big guy to say, hey, now we respect you. Mm -hmm. We're very much about helping people manage their real-life business relationships, mm -hmm. not virtual relationships. There you go. Two things that come to mind. Number one. Do you feel like you've broken the stereotypical chicken or egg syndrome that exists in, soft, in, in SaaS companies? You know what I mean by that? I'm not sure which you're referring to. Which comes first? Oh. Customer acquisition or the platform? And that circular motion of that you've got to have critical mass to grow. Right. And getting critical mass is doggone difficult. From what I'm seeing, you've broken that model. So there was a marketing firm called Sashi and Sashi, I think, right? mm -hmm. many years ago, who said, it's good to be big, it's better to be best, but it's best to be bold. Or marketing. I think they broke up. That time. <laughs> um, but um, it's, it's a challenge, right? So um, one of the, it kind of harks back to one of the previous comments. One of the critical decisions that we bounce around all the time is, all right, we've got a limited budget. How much do we spend on marketing? How much do we spend on product? We can definitely make the product better as it sits right now. We can definitely add new features and functions, but we also want to get it out into user hand. So you can say, screw it, we're just going to spend all the money perfecting the product. Don't worry about additional users. Just get this product absolutely 100%. Two years go by, markets passed us by, maybe we're wrong. Or the opposite side, which is, hey, we're just going to market it as is and not worry about it and see what happens. And then we realize, oh, the product just didn't quite scratch that itch or whatever, right? Um, it's a balance, right? You kind of have to bootstrap. You do a little of one and you try and you see what kind of feedback you get and you reach out to others and you just keep moving forward on both fronts as best you can. And the hard part really comes down to, when it comes you know, to me, how many dollars do I spend here? How many dollars do I spend there? And that's like the hardest thing. It's easy to say, oh, it should be 50-50, 60-40, but then you're presented with a great marketing, right? We have a wonderful marketing uh, firm that's helping us, it's in the back room, the Pauza. Um, so you know, how many dollars do we spend on this campaign versus how many more dollars do we spend on some of the roadmap items that we have? It's tough, it's tough. I will, I will add to that that the, the, the one of the toughest challenges is solving the cold start problem. How do you get, you have to have enough people on the network for it to be worth other people to be on the network, and how do you get enough people on the network if there aren't other people on the network? Um, and I think we have some we have some pretty strong ideas about doing that in terms of going to market through networking organizations and alumni associations, both of whom um, have a need in a lot of ways to create a community around their membership in the case of networking organizations and in the case of alumni association around their alumni to prove the value of being a member in the organization or prove the value of having been an alumni of that school uh, or an alum of that school. So uh, we have a strategy uh, that we're working on executing to deploy the product uh, and to take it to market this way and, and hopefully it'll prove out to be a success to overcome that cold star problem. And we're focusing at the same time geographically uh, on Maryland to do that because obviously the more all of those different organizations interconnect with each other and the membership starts to interconnect and overlap, the more people are on the system uh, 
connecting those different organizations together, the more the thing can start to take off and achieve some level of virality. Okay. Um, number one, you just said beautifully that you did break the chicken and egg scenario, and that is you found a way to go in through a foundation of organizations, particularly networking organizations, where you have that built-in vested interest group. One of, tell me about how you guys are going to get to that tipping point, crossing the proverbial chasm of 18 to 24 percent share of the market, where you go from your pioneer, you know, your bleeding edge pioneers and early <coughs> adopters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to where you're in the early majority mass market of your, of you know, of the population in which you want to play. Sure. How do you, what's your plan? Yep, plan. So, um, one of the great things in the last couple of months that we've been able to see is the Swish engine, right? And I'll talk about the wall in a moment. <clears throat> when people are posting their wishes, their business wishes, so job opportunity, looking for clients, speaking engagement, mentorship, or there's a dozen different categories that we have identified. The first time you get a wish fulfilled, it's kind of a random thing that you wouldn't necessarily go into a networking event and say, hi, I'm David and I'm looking for a speaking opportunity, you know, right? It's like a game of go fish, right? Nobody wants to do that. But you can post it and it's not pe in people's face, right? People can then look and say, oh, you know, I met David, he's a really good guy. What's, he, what's his wish? Oh, I know somebody, let me connect him. The first time you get a wish fulfilled through Treble, this magical light bulb goes off and says, hey, there's something here. And so our thinking is, as we get people to engage in the platform and see the power of passively crowdsourcing your business requests, and the idea came to us because it was, it was codifying serendipity, right? You're at an event, you meet somebody, you're talking about sports and weather and small talk, and then you just happen to mention, you know, this is an alma mater. Oh my goodness, my kid goes there. It's, a, it's some connection that sparks this amazing phenomenon, and so we built an engine that codifies that, that makes it more likely that you'll find ways to help people because you know exactly what they're looking for. Think bridal registry, right? When we get that out and you start seeing people going, oh my God, this is great. You know, I just found a job to it. Uh, I made a great connection this way. I was looking for a speaker for an event and this, and I was looking for a board appointment. It's these kinds of little light bulb major events. And that's why people network. They're looking for these kind of opportunities. When that starts happening in mass, it then inflects up. We're here today. Startup Brian is going to be part of the Treble family, quote unquote. Yep. Give us a sense what's the runway look like over the next 24 to 36 months. For sure. Yes. So we're thrilled to be partnering with Startup Prime. We have a number of, as um, Chris mentioned, we have a number of different organizations that we brought on board early. So we applaud these early adopters. Um, and part of our platform is designed specifically for these business associations, alumni groups, and networking for both job opportunities as well as client and professional business development engagements. And we're thrilled to bring these on board and we're rolling out very aggressive um, a strategy. We've got uh, two business development folks in the room with us, Hubert and, and Tim. So if you know any business organizations, that's one of my wishes, it's up on the wall. Um, so we think, being able to go after these kinds of organizations, show them the value proposition, show them the dashboard that we're able to create for the organization to help them build community. What most of the organizations, and I think when you said early on the mission for Startup Prime is building community and telling people it's not about what you want, it's about helping other people, I'm using my phrase, but you had something very similar to the mission. When we're able to show these organizations, our sales cycle, surprisingly, I originally built a mathematical model saying, yeah, it's going to take six to nine months to enterprise class sales. That's what it usually takes, right? We're finding weeks from explanation to demo to signed contract. It's just a few weeks because organizations like Startup Prime, they get it. They've been looking for a tool that we built, you know, their whole time. And for us to be able to build communities that allow people to help each other, and that's why most people are here tonight, right? They're eager to help other people. They're, they have their own needs and wants, sure, and they're looking for new clients and looking for new opportunities, but they're also willing to give back. And our ability to create that, that will start catching on. And we're hoping that realistically, the platform makes money, the platform grows, but we're also making, hoping that we make the world a little bit more kind, right? A little
little bit more altruistic, a little bit more treble, right? You know, how do I help you? How can I help you achieve your goals? You know, cost me nothing but a phone call or an email or an introduction to make a connection, and only good things come out of that, right? Uh, even if it's the wrong connection, the person says, hey, David, I appreciate that, but the ability to make that happen, that's what we're trying to catch on, and then I think everything else from there follows. Organizations, we're going to have a great marketing campaign. We better have a great marketing campaign. <laughs> and when we start getting the word out, we've been growing completely word of mouth at this point, right? Um, so once we get the marketing behind us and we start getting organizations like Startup Brian Columbia behind us and we have people <coughs> experiencing this kind of aha moment. And the Startup Brand Baltimore. The Startup Brand Baltimore. <laughs> um, once we get those kind of people, that kind of critical mass, that's that's the success that we'll see. Gentlemen, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now, questions, if you if you have time. Got time. Okay. This is a two-way street, so we feel don't have, free. We don't have a call with India until 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Any welcome to Yes, Andrew. Quick question. So uh, I'm part of a lot of networking groups and organizations that I've heard uh, that have already pitched the trouble thing. I already have a app. I'm ready to see the demo and check it out. Good. Uh, being a millennial, um, I'm 26, um, I own my own company. Um, I see this being a good platform for my organization. Um, but nonetheless, how do you see this for the millennials? Um, is this straying or maybe going toward a social media platform? Or do you see it having some type of... <laughs> no, it's, 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 no, no, it's great, it's, great, great right. question. You have to take in, the in, in, my, in my opinion, I, use, I, I re engineer um, LinkedIn and Facebook to gain audience. I want to show people what we do, what my colleagues do, what my partners do, and it's a good way to show them like it's a TV commercial, right? Free advertisement, I'm not paying for those services. So, in a sense, <coughs> I love the idea. I love being able to connect with people and, and give references. I'm a giver, for sure. Um, but uh, I guess, how do we, or how do you plan to grab the attention of the the younger generation, in a sense of, to pay for it for some of the services. Sure, uh, I'll tack a little bit, and I'm sure Eric will tack a little bit as well. So, um, first, one of the easiest ways to differentiate us versus a social media site, and that's a setup for Eric, right, is social media sites are really great for advertising, self-promotion, right? You can post things like, hey, look at my company, we just won this award, uh, I'm so pleased that we just hired so-and-so. It's an advertising platform which is different from networking, right? Networking, I don't have to go around and say, I just introduced Eric to Lisa. You know, hey, look at me, I'm great, because I introduced these two. The value is in helping Eric meet Lisa, right? And as long as I know, that's all that matters, right? And so, as long as Eric and Lisa. And as long as they make the connection, right? So it's not this promotion. There's always gonna be a place for promotion in social media sites. You know, you got a your company, you wanna get the word out. Ironically enough, I've been posting, and, and Molly, who's our, our marketing person, we post a lot on LinkedIn and Facebook, you know, getting the word out. But in terms of my networking, when somebody says, David, can you make an introduction, that's travel, right? So it's a very different value prop. In terms of going millennials, what's interesting is, I think the millennials provide a tremendous opportunity because they're more likely to try new technology. You know, there's Periscope and Instagram and Snapchat. Well, I mean, millennials are fearless in terms of trying new things and saying, does this work or not work? So I think we have a great opportunity there. And then yet, when you look at the, the older generation, like myself and Eric, it's we've got networks, and we're trying to figure out how do we leverage them better. So we have a slightly different message for you know folks that are in this age group than the folks that are in the other age. So yeah, so so just to follow on to that, and the reason we both sort of reacted when you asked the question is because we started a debate in the lead up to this about whether we were a social media company or not. Because I said, I, there was an email exchange where I said something about being a social media company. David said, we're not a social media company. I said, what are you talking about, we're not a social media company? So I had to send him the definition of social media. And when David says, well, we're not a social media company, he means it in the context of like LinkedIn and Facebook where people are constantly posting things for visibility purposes. He means in that context, in terms of social media, that's not what we're about. But one of the one of the parts of, of a definition of a so, of social media is social networking, and we are in a way about social networking. We're about 
electronically connecting people using you know, the internet and these tools to socially network each other with each other. And so from that side of the definition, I think we are a social media company, but not in the sort of in-your-face, noisy kind of way. And so that's, I think, the debate we were kind of having about whether we're a social media company or not. Two questions. One is, you, you know, you have specialized skills of social media, social networking, whatever you call it, right? You know, when you were making your pitches to investors, they are thinking Facebook and LinkedIn, and maybe LinkedIn can take whatever your idea is, pivot a little bit, and be able to incorporate some of the features and you know, they are there ahead of the game. How did you raise money? How did you distinguish yourself from people who are already in the market to say what you provide is value that nobody else has? Yeah. That's the question. So, yeah, good question. So, you know, it comes back to, you know, first philosophy, right? Um, we have a very different, we're founded on a very different philosophy than the traditional Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. You were based on this concept of helping other people, and it's not self-promotion, which is what you get with, you know, the social media side of technology. <clears throat> so people, our investors, they get that, right? They see that there's a need for something that's much more intimate, because networking really is personal, right? I put my reputation on the line when I make an introduction from person A to person B, which is very different than me posting something on one of the classic social media sites and saying, hey, you know, come to this event, blah, 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 right? It's, that's a more promotion. So our investors are savvy enough, and most of them have that business networking background. They realize there is a need in the market for something that's very different, that's not just promotion, but a CRM, as Eric mentioned, a CRM for your network, like a network relationship management platform. And that's how we position the company, and that has resonated most with our investors. Yeah, most of our investors who this resonated with immediately said, yeah, I can't stand LinkedIn. <laughs> I can't stand it. I don't, I don't get it. I, can't, I, I have it. I'm on it because I have to be, but I hate it. Right? And we, we actually, for a long time in our pitch materials, the second slide we showed people was a post somebody put up on LinkedIn saying how LinkedIn had turned into a site, more of a dating site, and how it was all about you know, self-promotion and how terrible it was and saying hopefully there'll be a new alternative to LinkedIn soon. Second, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Second question. Your, uh, how do you capture networking or referrals that happen outside your app? Yeah, we actually have a, a button that allows you to click and say, um, I made this referral introduction outside the app. What's so, the incentive for me to do that? Log right, on, keep it, some people want to track um, and we also have a historical, historical data, data, right? So some people want to be able to track who was it that introduced me and who did I help three years ago? And most people don't have a perfect memory when it comes to how many introductions that they've made, referrals. And you know, as Eric cited the uh, Adam Grant book, you know, 80% of the business workforce are scorekeepers. They kind of keep in the back of their mind, who owes me a favor? Who do I need to reach out to? I help that person immensely. And we built into the platform all these tools that you can opt in or not use, like a perceived value capability. So if I make a referral to Eric for a piece of business that I think is worth a million dollars, I could say, I send Eric what I think is a million dollar piece of business. It's a private note to me, but over the next three years, four years, you know, hopefully I send him millions of dollars worth of business, and then one day I say, hopefully, <laughs> and one day I might say, hey Eric, you know, um, uh, how about, uh, you know, whatever happened to XYZ? In fact, this happened just recently, one of our core partners is Kiwi Tech. They're our Indian offshore software development. Uh, they're also an investor with us. And I've referred several people over, and when I was having dinner with um, their vice president, I said, oh, by the way, and I pull up the app, um, did you ever follow up with this one, this one, this one? This? And four of the five had converted, and the fifth one, he had forgotten. So of course I gave him grief about that. Like, how did you forget this one, right? It's like four of the five, you better call the others. Oh my god. So they followed up. So the ability for me, to track who I made those introductions to, the referrals, and that's real business. Um, that's a personal CRM-like tool, and pers purely optional, but for people that want to keep score, the scorekeeping mechanisms are there. Paul. Well, that was almost my question. I just want to be sure. We would be able to connect either two people or 
with somebody who's already in trouble with somebody who's not. Correct. You can connect but two people that are not. The one thing that strikes me is that that puts us in a position, willingly, of being a salesperson for travel. So can there be something that goes along with that transaction where they get a bug at the bottom that says if you like... It's already in there. I mean, because <laughs> if we're fans of this, we're going to want everybody that we designate in our own value system to be there. So if we can make it easy for them, I mean, if you like this, you ought to see what you can do. Yeah. Something like that. Every, every introduction or referral you make goes out through real email. <laughs> goes into whether they're on treble or not. It also goes through the email and you get a copy of it through your email. And at the bottom it says powered by treble and there's links to our, you know, okay, to good. if you click on the link, it'll take you right to the app store to sign up or you know there's links to our Facebook and LinkedIn and all those things. So and that's just a good segue for one more thing. So we're gonna have a contest mm -hmm. um, and in a month um, whoever has invited the most number of people from tonight forward to join Treble, we'll win a prize. And Lauren, do you want to just? Yeah, you know, so we have our contest running starting tonight, as David said. And so if you invite people, one of the things that we haven't really touched on is this concept of templates. And so in the platform, you have a number of templates that you can customize. We have them redefined for you just to help you quickly make that introduction or referral. Um, but we also have with the ability to invite people through the platform. So as you're getting on board, not only do you want to make a referral and introduction to get somebody on board, but you also want to just generally invite them onto the platform. So you can invite them, and if you invite them and you send the most invites starting tonight, from a month from now, you'll win an Amazon Echo. Done. Bear with me just a sec. Um, what we're going to be doing is, if it's OK, take a two or three minute break to do whatever we need to do, food, beverage, etc. Um, and then we're going, then I'm going to introduce the treble team and we're going to go into more of the how to's and the rollout, etc. Are there any more questions that you might like to ask Eric or uh, David? Yes. Professor, I really like how you explained your uh, value proposition, how you sort of differentiated, you know, maybe like more traditional collaborative filtering from what you guys do with graph theory or using Karma is sort of like a utility function in school. That's um, cool. Well, what's your background? Uh, I'm like a machine learning researcher. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was great about how you yep. sort of boiled that down with that example. That's really cool. That's cool. Um, my question is, so when you're validating that model from an engineering perspective, this kind of like goes back to what Eric was saying with the cold start problem, how did you develop the engineering performance metrics to know that that model was going to be viable once it was going to be scaled? Mm. Wow. Faith, right? So um, when, when we worked on the algorithm, we looked at this, you know, we kind of started by looking at ourselves and saying, is this something that we need? Is this something that we think, you know, people like us will, will value? And then we started expanding the circle. And last year, right around this time, we had a beta test program. We invited tons of people. I think we had 178 people volunteer, of which we <coughs> shrunk it down to like 53 or something, to play with it for about a two-week process. Tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, give us all the feedback. And we started seeing the patterns. And we had, in the first week alone, three matches, three wish matches that hit. And the people were like, oh my god. And then one of the other ironic things, so it was mostly through our experimentation, right? One of the interesting things is um, we put scoring mechanism. Again, you know, 80% keep score and all that. And what we found was um, there were two people, one of which is in the room, so I won't embarrass her, um, that were really excited about you know getting high on that leaderboard because right. people are driven by you know visibility and scoring and all that kind of stuff. And our scoring mechanism is predicated on two philosophies. One, the more you help others, the more points you get. And two, there's an exponential decay built into these points. So you can't just binge for a weekend, you know, oh, maxed out my score, good to go, right? You know, for the rest of my life over time, and that's real life, right? You help somebody, but what have you done for me lately, right? Somebody helped me three years ago, but what have they done, right? So we have exponential decays built in, and a lot of these things were based upon our personal experiences and what we thought matched nature, reality, as well as feedback that we got during the beta testing. Great, thanks. Okay, um, oh, I'm sorry, go just, ahead. Yeah, just real quick, just, just to, I wasn't actually even thinking of the, the millennial thing until, you know, until he brought it up, but, but with the, you know, so 
you know, millennials like will try stuff, but they'll also like abandon it relatively quickly. So, um, and so like I have, you know, I have an app that's like dating for networking. You know, it's like Tinder for networking, and um, and and you find, you know, if you're not getting quality stuff, you just abandon it, right? And so, uh, are you guys doing anything to like? Which app is that, by the way? Uh, sure. Shaper. Yeah. 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 So, like it. yeah. Anyway. so it's one of the real drawbacks with that. One. Yeah. Like, so, like David likes to say, what are you going to do with like 30 contacts in a, in a week? Right. So, so well, it's going to tell, well, you, tell well, you to meet 30 well, new people. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, my question is, is, is how are you going to ask people for patience as you get, you know, yeah. to, to, to keep using it as, because, so there's network effects that, you know, you want more people to use it, but you don't want people to abandon it, you know, before. Yeah, more people yeah. join. So it's, it's a great question, right? And it's ultimately an education process. So we need to do a better job at explaining to the market, as well as building into the product, the philosophy that unlike your experience to date using social media, where you jump on, it's like you get bombarded. Hey, here's your high school girlfriend's cousin's uncle's dog keeper. You know, it's like you get bombarded with contacts, most of which are completely useless, but then you feel like I'm connected, right? Our philosophy is most people already know some folks, and the real value is by unlocking the relationships that you currently have. So part of the education process that we need to get out, and that patience, like you said, is to tell people, you're going to jump, jump on the app, and right now, there's a good chance that most of the people that you know are not yet on the app. You're not going to get value by randomly connecting to total strangers. That's not what we're about. You'll get that value by helping people that you already know, and maybe they're not on the app. So we built in the process where even if people aren't on the app, you can use the app to make the introductions, track it for your own edification, et cetera, and then hopefully <coughs> invite them to join and say, hey, look, I'll be able to post wishes that only my trusted network will be able to see. So if you join, you can post wishes that only your trusted network will see. And we're hoping to rely on that education process and a little bit of patience to get people to that whole different philosophy which is so different from the LinkedIn and, uh, LinkedIn and, and Facebook. I, th I think it's one of the reasons at this earliest stage, we're in the room with a lot of people who right. are using it. Yeah. I mean, we, we need to get the people in this room, for example, comfortable with it before we move on to a Yeah, no, I mean, you guys, you guys sell great. Like, audience, I, I like this right? 20 more times better than I right. do when you walk in the room. Right? <laughs> but, but you can't, but you can't, but you can't, you know, I mean, me. I mean, we're going to clone me and David. <laughs> <laughs> We've got okay. a great marketing company out there, too, so we're going to have to deliver with a great... No pressure. Out. One last yeah, question, and then we're going to transition right into the second half. Go ahead. Two well, things. I think as you develop this for organizations, one of the things that you can use as your retention tool is instead of farming out the training on it, making sure that it stays true to trouble, and making sure that people are involved, uh, sister organizations that are actually... Engaging things, making sure the message stays the same. That's been one of the problems with LinkedIn. You got all these little organizations trying to be LinkedIn experts. The other thing, from a from the standpoint of individuals, uh, I've often thought about a retention tool there, and in this case, it could be clearly um, technology based, which would be uniquely different than any other um, social platform that's out there as a means of keeping people engaged, kind of a retention tool. Yeah. Our retention person is in here, there he is, there he is right? So um, we'll make sure you picture your brain a little bit more. Um, before we transition really quick, I just want to mention, we have a wish wall, right? So hopefully we'll have a chance to explain the app to you more, a little more detail, <coughs> give you a demo, etc. cetera. Um, but we decided to do a physical manifestation of the wish wall. In the app, you have the ability to post a wish and decide at what level you want to share it with the whole world, just your trusted network, these people, the people that are part of Startup Prime, Baltimore, Columbia, you know, whatever, right? The wishes fall into a number of different categories, and there are a dozen of them. And the idea is you share it. Uh, the free users get one wish per month, and they go away at the end of the month. The premium get three, the ultra get nine. You also get permanent wishes, things like that. But what we're doing for tonight is having a physical manifestation. So on the walls, uh, both here and in the back, <coughs> we're asking people, post a wish, right? Take a few moments, write down a wish, you know, I'm looking for speaking engagement, I'm looking for a new client, you know, I sell this kind of services, or I'm involved, I'm an accountant, a lawyer, real estate agent, et cetera, et cetera. Post your wishes on the wall, and most importantly, look for other wishes that you can fulfill, right? We ask people to put their name, 
um, the category of the wish, it's okay if you don't know who posted some things, right? And then the description, and we want you to do that in, in a month, we're asking people, you know, after tonight, post a wish online, download the app, load it up, post a wish online, and in a month we're gonna come back and say, you know, here are the wishes that were filled, and we'll have another prize for the genie of the month, the person that fulfilled the other, you know, other people's wishes the most. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. Obviously, we're going to just do a real short transition to the rest of your team. Awesome. So, thank you, gentlemen.